Hi, my name is Mike Hamilton. And I'm Fred Langston. And we're here today to uh, give you some predictions and talk about the value of detection response and managing the impact of what is now a foreseeable event. You can call it a cybersecurity breach, you can call it an incident, doesn't matter what you call it, it's coming to your doorstep. Uh, you can uh, uh, have the help desk clean up a workstation or the FBI can call and tell you your customer records are for sale online. Which of those impacts you end up with is up to you. So without any uh, further delay, let's jump in. First, a little bit about us. Uh, Mike Hamilton, I've been in uh, the information security business for about 30 years. Uh, the last 10 years or so have been in government. You can see that I've worked at the local, state, and federal level. Federal's not reflected there. I was a vice chair of a Homeland Security Government Coordinating Council. And uh, I go way back in time to uh, an education in earth science. Fred? Yeah, I'm about the uh, same amount of time, almost 25 plus years, uh, long history in consulting uh, for information security. And back in the early or mid 90s, uh, I was on a working group at IBM that helped write part of the HIPAA security rule. Okay, so first, let's talk some predictions. Uh, before we do, uh, let me talk about where we are. So um, because I spent a lot of time in government, uh, this really resonates with me and I, and I like to use government as an example because it encompasses a lot of what Homeland Security calls the critical sectors. There's 16 of these now, dams, water, finance, energy, health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it turns out that uh, your local government does a whole bunch of these. They do an amazing number of things that actually keep us alive. Water purification, waste treatment, traffic management, communications for law enforcement, public safety, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm going to try and drive this as much as I can uh, to a local level where uh, everybody can kind of understand what the impact to them personally may be. Um, meanwhile, uh, here we are. Uh, your uh, local government does a whole lot of things for you, and we are adding Internet of Things technologies for building energy maintenance, automated traffic management, uh, uh, automated metering for water and power, et cetera, et cetera. What could possibly go wrong? Well, let's look at a few headlines here. So uh, here's uh, 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 what happens when there is a ransomware attack uh, against a public sector institution. And uh, everybody knows that ransomware is the, further, the worst thing that could ever possibly happen, right? No, ransomware is not the worst thing that can possibly happen. And in fact, ransomware is another example of the cybersecurity industry's dumb words. Uh, this is disruption for the purpose of extortion. That's what ransomware is. But if we think about this kind of disruption for the purpose of extortion applied to things like, I don't know, your clean water in your flushing toilet, all of a sudden we land in a very bad place. Um, what I like to do is um, package the uh, messaging in a way that's easy to understand by non-technical folks. So um, when we talk about impacts, um, what we like to do is talk about the three things that go wrong, the three outcomes that you want to avoid. So records disclosure, this is the one that ends up in the news all the time. We know that this costs somewhere between $150 and $400 per record to clean up um, in complying with uh, the state data breach reporting acts, and now 50 states have these. Theft and its pal extortion, uh, that was where the ransomware would fit in. Uh, we know that this is 75,000 to 1.2 million in our region in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's multiple millions elsewhere. This, has, uh, this has gone way out of control. Uh, again, this is disruption for the purpose of extortion, disruption for the purpose of disruption, is also starting to occur. And if you've done your business continuity planning, you know on a minute by minute basis, if your ability to operate is disrupted, you know exactly what that's going to cost. So one good thing to keep in mind is packaging things in simple terms. Here's what we want to avoid and assigning dollar values to each. That way we, we talk about dollar amounts of liability rather than scary Russian cyber buffer overflow. Um, one more thing, I'm, we're, we're gonna lean into uh, open source intelligence here, uh, also known as the news. And so we use a lot of headlines to kind of buttress what we say, 
Um, we've been doing the IT security news blast for 10 years now. And uh, uh, we'll tell you at the end how to subscribe here. If you want to get uh, about 20 curated articles, headline, money quote, and original link with no creepy ad tracking, uh, we'll, we'll tell you how to sign up for this. A lot of people uh, make this their, uh, their morning coffee reading. Uh, okay, uh, Fred, uh, you want to tell us about a few of the trends that are underway? You bet. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a whole bunch of the different threats that we see all the time. We have not only read about them, but we have clients calling us weekly, and sometimes more often, for every one of these types of threats that we're going to talk about here. We'll start with ransomware because everybody's pretty familiar with that. Um, it's, it was supposed to be a year when ransomware was going to start tapering off and other attacks uh, were going to become more prominent. But from what we're looking, looking at and seeing in the, uh, the headlines, it's not tapering off. Ransomware is still at a full clip, is still causing huge disruptions, and we're seeing it uh, moving across other types of, of environments. So it's not just your IT and data center and your, your computers in your office. It may move to other things like medical devices or cars even may be part of a ransomware attack. We also see the business email compromise uh, attacks as a continuous stream of threats that don't seem to be abating. We see uh, people using standard email, so it's not really hacking, it's more like fraud when you're doing business email compromises, but they're using very uh, advanced kind of phishing style attacks where they pose as a particular member of your staff, or commonly uh, a CEO or somebody in a position of power. They then send out emails under the guise of being that particular employee asking you to buy a hundred Apple gift cards and ship them to some specific address. Uh, one thing to note, this sounds very simplistic, but just yesterday there was a report of a major uh, US uh, charity organization that sent out $1.4 million in a business email compromise. This can be a major catastrophic impact. It's not small losses that you may uh, expect when you think about something like this. Let's talk about uh, how phishing sites now are starting to become more prominent than uh, attacks via malware. And one of the things to, to note why you may ask, why is this happening? Well, it's basically, it's a lot easier to set up a phishing attack than be an Uber hacker, uh, put together a set of very complex exploits and run the backend infrastructure to run that attack. Hey, I'm just gonna send you an email that's gonna trick you into going to my site downloading and installing the malware, and I don't have to be a hacker almost at all to make that happen. So what are they doing with uh, when they get these phishing sites and they're stealing uh, uh, accounts and, and passwords to go with it? They're using it for another type of attack uh, called credential stuffing. And you may have heard how you can go to things like Pastebin and sites that uh, people will post giant databases of accounts usernames and passwords together. So they're taking these, they're taking these huge databases posted online, and they're just blasting this information at every account they can see online and hoping that some of them uh, are successful in uh, compromising a particular account. Uh, we had a client this week that was suffering from this exact type of attack and we really don't have much that we can tell you to help on this other than make sure your employees are not reusing passwords in the business environment that they're also using at other accounts out on the internet. Uh, yeah, let me, let me just tell a quick story about this and, and connect this with um, 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 the, uh, the IoT business. Um, it says uh, bot-driven credential stuffing attacks, and we've actually seen this, so we have uh, a customer here that uh, I don't think we want to name, uh, but they called us up and said, hey, we are having our accounts uh, pounded uh, and people are getting locked out and can you take a look at this for us? And when we looked, what we found was it was indeed a credential stuffing attack. So they were trying to uh, reuse disclosed credentials that had been um, uh, found elsewhere, bought on the dark web. Um, uh, the stuff is readily available. And we found that this was all coming from compromised micro tick home routers in Brazil. So this bot-driven credential stuffing attacks, 
this is getting to be a bigger and bigger deal. And because this is so automated and comes so quickly, uh, the symptom that you're likely to see is uh, everybody in the organization getting uh, locked out. And cryptocurrency mining, another one you've probably heard about, the Department of Homeland Security this year predicted that cryptocurrency would be the biggest threat to systems here in the US. Um, it's probably turning out to be an accurate prediction. Uh, basically what they need, what they want when a cryptocurrency attack happens is they want that processor. So uh, unlike most of the things that we expect where they're trying to extort you or steal your data, uh, this is different. They're gonna use your resources against you. They're going to, or, or for their own benefit, I should say, and take those resources away from you to mine crypto coins. Um, one of the areas that people commonly don't think about when they think about this, they forget that it's not uncommon to try to take over AWS or Azure accounts and you get a bill at the end of the month for $12,000 because you had somebody attack an account there and is running a cryptocurrency miner uh, within those environments. Um, these are also very common to see on IoT type devices because they're poorly secured and they also uh, are a perfect uh, platform to do crypto mining because they have a processor and they have a network connection. The two things you need to do that kind of uh, attack. Uh, they've weaponized IoT to a point now where we have entire botnets built around it. The Mirai botnet in particular, very famous uh, botnet that is uh, basically was successful by using uh, stored or, or shared uh, usernames and passwords and default usernames and passwords. Uh, there is a massive database of products out there. Uh, literally uh, was reported to be billions of products that have these embedded, shared, or the same uh, usernames and passwords. They're well known. So it's trivial to take over these IoT systems, things like cameras and doorbells and those sorts of things. Um, so once they're taken over, they use for a couple types of attacks. We mentioned crypto mining, but there's also denial of service attacks. Uh, denial of service attacks um, are designed basically to uh, take a particular set of hundreds or thousands or even millions of these bots, use them to, to send network traffic at particular targets they want to attack, and they take them offline. A famous example of this uh, was a gentleman, Brian Krebs, who has the Krebs on security website. He was actually describing how an attack was happening. Well, the bad guys decided they were gonna shut him up and they were successful launching a three-day attack out of Mirai. Uh, against uh, Brian Krebs' website. Interestingly enough, when people go to launch these attacks, you go on the dark web and you go to sites that look almost like Amazon. It's almost like you're purchasing something off Amazon. You pick the number of bots you want to point at it. You pick the, the number of targets you want. You want how long you want it to happen. And it gives you a price. And basically, it's like ordering something at any e-commerce site. Okay, so there's, there's a lot more um, in terms of uh, extant threats today. And uh, here's just a few examples. Uh, commercial malware companies and the Pegasus spyware that um, is being sold to governments around the world for surveillance and, and frankly uh, making sure that human rights organizations don't see what they want to see. Hardware vulnerabilities, spec Spectre and Meltdown are the ones that we know about. There are many others. Uh, th these cannot be fixed, and uh, when you are compromised by one of these, it's nearly undetectable. We all know that there's a big third-party problem right now. Let me talk a little bit about this nation-state collateral damage, and I think a lot of people um, on the webinar today uh, know the story of the WannaCry attack, uh, which was a global ransomware attack, uh, which turned out to be the country of North Korea actually stealing money from people. Um, the sanctions have hurt him pretty badly. Right behind that, there was one that we call NotPetya, and it also looked like a global ransomware attack. When we finally peeled back the covers and did the attribution, what that was, was the country of Russia poking the economy, the economy of Ukraine. And they did that by backdooring a tax preparation software company and uh, inserting code into their product. When they decided to pull the trigger, it turned out that there was enough people, enough companies using that software and in the supply chain of larger companies, 
that the collateral damage started to accumulate. And Maersk, the shipper, Merck, the drug manufacturer, both went down for three weeks. Uh, Maersk is claiming a $300 million loss, Merck something similar. They were not the targets of the attack, they were collateral damage. And so today, nation state collateral damage, when you are not even the target, has landed on your doorstep. Okay, so here's a few predictions based on uh, a lot of things that we see happening. And some of these are pretty easy to make. So uh, distributed denial of service is gonna become uh, an, an extortion tool. Um, um, I, uh, one thing I'll follow up with what you said about Brian Krebs, Fred, um, when you get a distributed denial of service attack and you are being hosted in a data center, that data center doesn't want your business anymore and they will eject you. And that actually happens to Brian Krebs. Um, operational technologies, now firmly in scope for disruption. Recently, um, uh, Norse Hydro uh, was an aluminum uh, manufacturing organization in Norway and their operational technology, not exchange server, web server, routers, switches, firewalls, but uh, I have a computer screen and I move my mouse and a big pot pours molten aluminum into a, a cast, uh, for example. That's operational technology. It includes robotic manufacturing. It includes uh, port operations. Um, speaking of port operations, I think ransomware is gonna affect the transportation sector in a big way, as well as some of these others it already has. Uh, maritime ports turn out to be a gigantic economic uh, vulnerability for us, and so watch for that. Our economy is going to get poked just like Ukraine did. Um, there's some good things happening too. Um, we're seeing executives uh, treat uh, this whole cybersecurity business as risk to the business more than just a big scary thing that they want to hire somebody to make go away. Um, automation is going to start to help. Um, I don't think it's there yet. And uh, I think security will eventually become a competitive differentiator. Uh, as I wrote in a paper about 15 years ago, it took me 15 years to be right about it, but I think I'm getting right about it. Yeah, I also want to point out a really interesting development in the legal space. Uh, one of the companies that was hit with NotPetya is Mondelay, and they're the giant food services company. They have tons of products that you buy at your grocery store. Well, they went to their cyber insurer um, to make a claim about NotPetya, and their cyber insurance company said, you know what, you're not covered for this because we have an out for something that's considered an act of war. So one of the most important cybersecurity lawsuits or, and case, uh, cases is now in court uh, to determine whether that uh, exemption for an act of war is actually a valid statement on the, on the uh, part of the cyber insurer. So this will really be a case that determines how cyber insurance covers these types of events going forward. It's hugely important and impactful. Yeah, we're gonna have to watch that. That's a good point, Fred. So, all right, all right, what do we do now? All right, so clearly there's a whole bunch of bad things lined up against us. There always has been, uh, but I think in today's world, especially when we're talking about nation to nation acts that end up crushing business, uh, we gotta think about what we're gonna do here. So. Here's what uh, the, the evolution has looked like. Um, you know, way back in the 20th century, uh, we used to uh, talk about building that shell around the network and preventing compromises from happening, right? Keep the bad guys out of the network. Uh, and like I alluded to, today we talk about managing the risk of this foreseeable event. Clearly, with all of these things happening, this is a foreseeable event. This is going to happen. Um, as we think about managing this risk, uh, it's important to point out the terms in the expression of risk that are relevant here. So there's really only two. I've seen uh, integral calculus used in you know, risk assessment equations, but it's really unnecessary. There, there's two terms. There's the likelihood that a bad thing is going to happen. Okay, what's that bad thing? It's what we pointed out in the beginning. It's unauthorized disclosure of protected records, theft and extortion, or a service disruption. That's it. Think about those are the bad outcomes that we are trying to prevent. Then there's the impact term. What happens when that bad thing does become true? And what we did was we assigned some dollar values to this. And so those are important to keep in mind as we go forward, right? So there's two terms, the likelihood of a bad outcome and the impact of that outcome. So when we think about this, 
how do we buy down this risk? There's really two ways to do it. So when we talk about the likelihood of that bad thing happening, we put preventive controls in place. Preventive controls are designed to make bad things not happen. So we have intrusion prevention systems and application firewalls. Uh, not as many as we used to have, it's kind of an old thing, but URL filtering, uh, email security, dropping all the links and the bad attachments on the floor. I mean, there's other things that go in here, right? There's a, really a lot of things that we put in place to prevent those outcomes. If we want to buy down the impact term, that's about detection and response. So detective controls are where we invest. And there are some examples of some detective controls there. It's not just about the detective controls, it's about the human beings that evaluate the messaging coming off the detective controls, right? So in particular, you know that an intrusion detection system works like antivirus. It's got, it's a signature-based technology. It's got a big database of things that it doesn't want to see. And so it's watching the network wire and it, when it sees the pattern of the Zeus financial Trojan go by, it raises an alert and as a result, an IDS system is always going, look at me, look at me, something's going on, look at me. Um, and uh, providing those human investigators to ensure that we are correctly uh, 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 investigating the things that we should turns out to be the hardest part of this. As we know, those human investigators are in short supply, they cost a lot of money, and they're very difficult to retain because they know they can change jobs every six months and double their salary. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about what everybody I think is looking at as a savior in this industry. And I'm kind of here to tell you that while it's a great development, it's certainly not going to solve all our cybersecurity problems. Um, and that's AI and machine learning. Um, so the things to really understand about this, while they're, they're great advances, they have positives and they have negatives associated with them. So one thing I always like to say is, while we're spending a ton of money developing AI and machine learning solutions, so are the bad guys. And the bad guys are extremely well funded. We're talking China, we're talking Russia, we're not talking about a small group of hackers, we're talking about people that can throw millions or billions of dollars behind this. So they're developing AI that can be used in attack scenarios. And they're using AI uh, or attempts to retrain our AI our AI in a different way to not recognize their attacks. So we know uh, AI and machine learning is only as good as the data you train it with, right? So you need really good data to feed to it to come up with uh, the ability to do positive analysis. The problem with that is uh, the bad guys are also feeding these same systems sitting on our perimeters of our networks with bad data. They know that they have somebody that they really want to go after. They're going to slowly be trickling particular traffic at it that ultimately will train that system not to look at the things that they're going to be throwing at it at a later point. So they can use that machine learning as well as us and they can use it against us. Um, they can recognize your picture. Uh, machine learning can recognize your speech, your picture. Well, machine learning now and uh, something known as deep fakes can actually produce your own voice and speech or a picture of you doing things that you have never done. So we're, we're really stepping into an entirely new area uh, with the capabilities of AI. Can find uh, insights a human can't, but it also doesn't have the ability to explain how it came to those conclusions to a human. So while it may be telling you something, it can't tell you how it came to that conclusion. Yeah, and just as an aside, you know, as I go through all the news for the News Blast, I have read several articles, and a few have ended up in the blast, about how AI is being trained by rooms full of low-paid people in other countries who are using just empirical detections to feed back into a machine, and they're calling it AI. So I, you know, buyer beware, I think is... Yeah. My point. And there, there's one other kind of problem to it, and that is uh, while we are trying to solve people problems with uh, machine learning and AI, um, it's actually creating new people problems. It's harder to go out and get an AI engineer and hire one and retain one than it is to get somebody who's a good SOC analyst to work in your security operations center. So what we see most is that detection and the response to things that we detect is a major gap that all organizations to some degree suffer from. 
Um, we know that the average days until an asset uh, compromise is detected is 205 days. And in some industries and verticals, it's even longer than that. Um, it's kind of frightening to see that uh, over two thirds of victims, their first uh, understanding that they have been hacked is when the FBI gives them a phone call and says, hey, we know you guys are hacked and you have a problem. Um, and of course, you can probably uh, surmise that 90% or almost 90% of those people aren't compliant with regulations when these attacks actually happen. Shocking. Shocking. All right. Next slide, please. There we go. So the key metrics here, the things that we uh, want to keep uh, basically as metrics to us to manage our detection and response is something ultimately that come, is called dwell time, and which is the sum of two things. One is the time from when a compromise is detected. And then the second component is when it's detected to when it's been fully remediated and the, uh, the organization has recovered from that. So put these two together, you have something known as dwell time. This is the number one thing that can minimize the impact quotient of the risk equation Mike was talking about. We've spent so much time over the last 30 years focusing on that let's prevent these things from happening and forgetting about how critically important that impact component of the equation is. Well, the one way that you're gonna affect that, the number one way to affect that is to minimize dwell time, get the bad guys out quickly, detect them fast, and having good detection and response is basically the approach that you're going to use to do that. So how are we going to, how are we going to improve detection and response? Well, we can try to push it off onto IT. It's not something you know, that they're really good at. It's not something that they're built to do, but it kind of is one of those things where people shove it over and say, let's just hope those guys uh, can do this and add it on top of all their uh, digital transformation projects. Now they're 24-7, 365 looking at logs and alerts. That's, that's probably not maybe the, the best approach here. Um, we might try to uh, designate an authority, push it out to other people, um, try to have them uh, maybe work together to uh, federate this approach. Um, we might want to push it to the help desk or the service desk. They're the people that are the front line for this but they're also not people that are designed to be experts or even to recognize when something is reported, whether it's really bad, it's maybe not bad at all, or, or how quickly they need to respond. Well, we can go out and use interns. Um, you can maybe take the long path and uh, plan to train people up and spend a couple years getting there, or you can outsource it. Uh, there's a whole nascent space vertical that Gartner calls managed detection and response. Companies that do this, do only this, and do it 24-7, 365. Yeah, and let me just add one thing to that. There is, there's one option that isn't on this list. Uh, I, when I uh, was uh, uh, the CISO for the city of Seattle, uh, we actually did federate incident response across about 30 agencies, right? So there was always somebody I could tap on the shoulder out there. Uh, that took a lot of work to put that structure in place. The option that's not on here is you can build your own SOC operation and you can hire enough analysts to populate that SOC and provide the coverage that you need. That is phenomenally expensive. Um, so we didn't even add it to the list, but I thought I should bring that up. Okay, so what is managed detection and response? Um, this is the way that you uh, uh, add uh, technology to human beings to sift through the millions and millions and millions of alerts that come off the preventive and detective technologies that you already have in place. There are seriously millions per day. Uh, you, you will hear organizations, uh, especially the ones that have recently been wrapped on the knuckles, uh, in the city of Atlanta, for example, well, we experienced two million attacks per day. No, those are not attacks. That is the background noise of the internet. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but um, uh, using technology to home in on the small subset of all those alerts that are the ones that are the most likely to be real and then having human beings investigate whether or not those can be confirmed as actual incidents that's the trick. Manage detection and response does that by focusing these analysts in a single place 
and making them available to all of the organizations that want this managed service. This is uh, now uh, extremely popular as an alternative into taking on the job yourself. Fred talked about make it IT's job. Most organizations do exactly that. They make it IT, IT's job. When that happens, IT is drawn away from the digital transformation projects that are all going on. For example, that smart city I talked about. There's all kinds of activity around that. And if we impede IT from moving forward with those digital transformation projects so that they can chase all of these ghosts, you're doing both IT and security poorly. Uh, that's where managed detection and response comes in. It just takes all of that off your plate and provides you with actionable information. So making some risk-based choices here, um, first of all, consider background noise versus targeting, okay? The background noise of the internet, what most people report as here are the millions of attacks we get per day, are not that. Um, these are the, uh, the low-hanging fruit uh, shotgun blasts that go out across the internet. And they're looking for grossly unpatched internet-facing servers and um, uh, different ways of getting in through tricking users and things like that. In order to address these, you don't need artificial intelligence and machine learning. You need to do the simple stuff that we're all supposed to be doing. So if you, know, if you don't patch your systems and you don't train your users, you should not be buying artificial intelligence. You need to back up and start doing the stuff you were required to do. You can invest in new prevention strategies, buy even more point products to throw on your network and believe that they're gonna be this magic automation that makes the problem go away. Or you can invest in detection and response. Because business has started to treat cybersecurity as a business risk, it makes more sense to invest in detection and response to buy down that impact term that we talked about. Um, also, Fred talked about regulatory uh, compliance being um, uh, uh, not attainable for 90% uh, of breached companies. You know, if you're doing that simple stuff, it's all in those regulations. That simple stuff will raise your risk bar to the point where organized crime is not such a problem, insiders are detectable, um, and you are gonna have a greater likelihood of, of avoiding those bad outcomes we talked about. Records disclosure, theft and extortion, and service disruption. Uh, okay, uh, go ahead, Fred. Yeah, I'm gonna cover kind of the, the problems we see with IoT. We all know that that's uh, a burgeoning problem, especially around security. Uh, one thing that we find most interesting is you can't install things like agents or security software on 99% of IoT devices. So the only controls you may have is a good monitoring and detection program on the network where you're watching the type of activities coming and going to these IoT devices. We know they're highly insecure. So we need to do things to make sure that we're protecting ourselves as we're throwing these on our networks at an increasing rate every day. Uh, we need to have policy, right? We need to know what should be going on our network. I see things like Alexa getting thrown into uh, medical uh, uh, caregiving environments. Uh, that's an instantaneous HIPAA violation. So, I mean, these things are getting put in by uh, regular users and you may not even know that these technologies are being deployed. So you have to have a policy, you need to have approval, you need to know when these things are being deployed and you need to know every one of them that's on your network. You need to segment your network. You need to isolate these systems so when they get infected, and chances are they will, as we mentioned, many of these have almost no security and cannot be secured. So you need them on a, on a segment uh, so they cannot impact your critical systems and your systems with sensitive data. You need governance to make sure that people understand that, hey, we don't want this particular technology on your environment. And we need uh, ways to, uh, to reduce uh, the impacts uh, for these, and that is having good um, managed detection and response. Uh, we do have a couple tools there on the right you may want to try out. You can go take a quick risk analysis on 
how your IOT uh, risk may be. And there's a little, uh, a little uh, white paper there on how to hack a camera. It can show you how easily these particular attacks can be under, uh, undertaken. Okay, all right, so real briefly, uh, I, wanna, I wanna drill down a little bit and tie together a few of these things. So we talked about the fact that uh, analysts are hard to come by. Um, we talked about the fact that managed detection and response uh, focuses and centralizes uh, those analysts in one place for the benefit of a number of organizations. Uh, because we are in that business, we need to make sure that our analyst capacity stays in front of customer demand so that we can always have a sufficient number of eyes on customer data. So uh, here's what we do. We use the Public Infrastructure Security Collaboration and Exchange System, which is something that we developed as a nonprofit. Um, what we do is we monitor down market cities and counties for free in collaboration with the Pisces nonprofit and with Western Washington University, soon three more universities, and we're talking to all kinds of other people about this. It makes sense because we need the infrastructure protection for those down market cities and counties. They make your toilet flush and your water drinkable, but they don't have the size of a general fund to pay for technology, to hire people, or even pay for a service. So what we do is we use a reduced functionality version of our monitoring stack, deploy that to smaller cities and counties, and rather than collecting information and bringing it back to our SOC, Western Washington University has built curriculum around it and students are training on live fire. So yeah, they get a university degree, possibly a certification, uh, uh, but more importantly, they have the experience of sitting down as an operational analyst, looking at this live fire against critical infrastructure in their own neighborhoods. And when they come out of there, they are instantly hireable there's actually a lot of competition for these resources. We're doing our best to hire them all here, uh, but turns out they're really good. Um, here's an example of some of the research uh, that came out of the very first quarter. This is by uh, Carl Hubbard, who now works for us. Uh, what I wanna tell you about this is that uh, uh, Carl submitted this poster to a competition in New Orleans. There was no funding for him to attend. Uh, he was talking about his experience with the Pisces project and what they had learned in one quarter of reviewing the data that they were collecting. Uh, the poster took second, despite the fact that he was not standing in front of his poster to explain it to anyone. Okay, to wrap, you don't have to run faster than the bear. The bear is out there and the bear is aiming indiscriminately, but you don't have to run faster than the bear. You need to do the simple stuff. Remember that service disruption for the purpose of extortion is happening at an epidemic rate. Um, when we talk about the uh, inconvenience of locking up a workstation and having to go get a backup, that's one thing. When we talk about the control systems that operate the services that keep us alive, that is completely different. Um, focus on detection and response. We've all overbought preventive controls. Focus on detective, detection and response. Um, I'd say hold your vendors to a security standard too. Uh, in the third party security world, everybody's looking at everybody else and saying, show me your security papers. Be prepared to have security papers. Uh, and lastly, I'll say policy and procurement are tools you can use for security. When you buy things with the requirement that they are secure out of the box, that there's a plan going forward, you'll be notified of vulnerabilities and patches will be provided. We start to get into this competitive differentiator space where vendors hold up their hand and they say, buy from me, I'm more secure than my competitor. That's a good place to be and you can force that through your procurement process. Okay, all right, thank you very much. I'm Mike Hamilton. And I'm Fred Langston. Uh, and this is how to get a hold of us. And uh, uh, thank you for watching.